Let's go to Ecclesiastes. From John to Ecclesiastes. Amen. <laughs> we serve a mighty God. And all the rest who are visiting us for the very first time. Feel that Jesus, thank you for joining us this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now, how many of you were here when I shared a uh, couple of Sundays back from Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 10, uh, about sharpening our axes? Um, I want to encourage you, go and listen to that word, um, and uh, it will bless you. It will bless you. And I'm just going to pick up from there. This is kind of a part two uh, from that. Because uh, I want to encourage the people of God. I want to encourage you uh, to be positioned to be able to uh, have the greatest return uh, out of this year, 2021. For, for us to be able to get the most out of our time and out of our day. So Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes 10, uh, let's, let's go here, all right, amen, all right, so it wouldn't turn off on me. Verse 10, and I'm going to talk, just, just lay this as a foundation, and we're going to look at the next point. Now, I was speaking about foundations for success when I was talking about sharpening our axes, and, uh, but let's look at the, this particular passage, and then um, I will just highlight some points from my message two weeks ago, and then uh, start up on the message that the Lord has given me for, t for today. It says, uh, he who digs a pit will fall into it, in verse 8 of Ecclesiastes 10. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever breaks through a wall will be beaten by a serpent. Verse 9, he who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits wood may be endangered by it. Verse 10, if, an, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then we must use more strength, but wisdom brings success. So we were really, uh, what we were talking about when I was speaking that message is wisdom for success. Wisdom brings success. And so you can put this as a part two of that message uh, that I shared, uh, wisdom for success. Now, the, what I spoke of last uh, two Sundays ago, because last Sunday we had uh, the, um, Linda Worrell sharing, and what a blessing she was. Amen. Uh, and, uh, but what the Lord showed me um, two Sundays ago as I was sharing, just to touch on some highlights of, uh, of that message. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, and we looked at the axe being the tools, the implements, the things that God gives to us in order to get the job done, to get stuff done, uh, the skills that we need. And we talked about sharpening our axe, that it is important for us to sharpen our axe, to sharpen that which God has given given us in order to be able to bring in or be able to, to, to see the breakthroughs of the Lord coming. I said last, uh, last uh, two Sundays ago that, that uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to have the gift. It's, in, it's another thing to have the anointing. You see, the gift, uh, you don't need to do much. The gift is given to us freely. Freely you have received. That's the gift of the Spirit. But the anointing takes preparation. And so sometimes you can have the gift, which is the ox, but, but really the anointing which comes by preparation is, which, is that which allows your gift to be able to do a quick job or be able to do a quick work. And so we spoke about the importance of us sharpening our access. Whatever God has given you, it is okay to do some courses if you need to. Spend time in prayer if that's what you need for your acts. Whatever it is that God has put in your hands. And let me just say this. Everybody has got something in their hands. Now, nobody has got, no one has everything. But everyone has something. And every time God wants to get a job done, he will always ask you, what do you have in your hands? Many times we're always looking for God to do it from heaven. But in reality, when God wants to do something on this earth, everything that he will use is already in your hands. 
So he will ask you, what do you have in your hands? And so I'm talking about the axe and how the axe is what we need or what we use in order to go from one level of blessing to another level of blessing, from one level of expansion to another level of expansion. And we read from 2 Kings, I believe chapter 6, which is the story of the sons of the prophets and how the place where they dwell had become too small. And they said, allow us to go and cut down some trees. And one of them took an axe with them. So an axe is what you need in order to go from a small place to a big place and in order to go from a place where you are to a place of advancement to a bigger place and so every time you need to go anywhere or to be established in greater things you need the axe you need an axe in your hands your gift your talent whatever God has put in your hands that is what God will use to open doors for you to take you to the next level and we talked about how it is important that we we partner with God in everything that we do I said uh, last Sunday that, that uh, faith is not uh, an excuse or faith does not, uh, um, does, does, does not excuse us from hard work. It doesn't, it doesn't, we don't, we don't, you know, faith does not substitute us from hard, working hard. And so we looked at that and we saw it's important that we learn how to work hard. We learn how to swing our axe. We learn how to sharpen that which God has given us. If we are going to see the breakthroughs that God wants to give uh, into our lives. So let me just say this. Your future, your destiny, your being able to fulfill everything God has called you to fulfill, to do, has to do with the amount of work you do with the acts God has given you. So if we can sharpen our axe, the Bible says, then it becomes a lot easier. He was, he talks about he must, um, and one does not sharpen, uh, if, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, but wisdom brings success. Not only use more strength, but it takes time. It takes a lot longer to get to your breakthrough, to get to your destiny. Um, if we are operating with axes or, or skills that are not being sharpened to that place. Amen. How many of you are getting something out of this? And so it's important that we understand that each and every one have, have got an axe, have got a gift, and a, a, a talent that God has put in our hands. Now we're going to go backwards. We, we, that was verse 10, but we're going to look this morning at verse 9. It says, he who quarries stones may be hurt by them. And he who splits wood may be endangered by it. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. And he who splits wood may be endangered by it. I want to just focus this morning on the risk that we have to overcome in order to see success and breakthroughs. You see, most of us, we think that if we're going to get to our destiny, it's going to be in the flowery beds of ease. It's not going to be so. Amen. How many of you know everything in this life has to be worked on? Amen. It has to be worked on. Everything, every relationship, every job, everything that you're being given by God to do or to have has to be worked on. Even your marriage, your relationships have to be worked on. They say to me, well, before we got married, they said, hey, marriage is a bed of roses. But how many of you know that there are thorns in roses? So you have to learn to handle the rose properly so you enjoy the beauty of the rose without being, being pricked in your hand. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You just don't grab it just like that, the way you want to grab it. So there's a, there a skill to navigating all that. There's a skill on how to handle every single thing. So most people don't like to attempt to do anything because of the risk that comes with stepping out. Every time we see Jesus, and let me just say this, every time you see Christ walking, coming towards you, you have an opportunity to stay in the boat or you have an opportunity to step out of the boat and do the greater works. Many are called, but few are chosen. One thing I've realized is many people talk about it, but they don't do anything about it. Let me just show you. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm going to go maybe to next week's message today. Let me show you a verse. Maybe if you can put it up on the screen, it may help somebody really get this understanding. Put Ecclesiastes 5.3 up on the screen. Ecclesiastes 5.3. This will help you to understand where I'm coming from. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3. The Bible says, for a dream comes through much activity. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. 
Somebody say, for a dream comes through much activity. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. Amen. So one of the things that we need to understand, a dream comes through much activity. Every, where do we get our dreams from? They come from God. Dreams and visions are a byproduct of the Holy Spirit coming and indwelling upon us. That's why the Bible tells us that in the last day, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And so one thing we need to understand is that the Holy Spirit comes and he gives us dreams. He releases dreams into our lives. And what that dream is, is an internal image. It's an internal picture that we have on the inside of us of where God wants to take us. So what is your dream for 2021? What is your dream for the next five years? What's your vision for the next five years? That picture that you see that the Holy Spirit births in you. Let me tell you this. It shall only come to pass through much activity. Somebody say amen. amen. I say the harvest is always a joint venture between a farmer and God. God will not do what the farmer must do. So the farmer must go out, he must prepare the ground, he must put the seed in the ground, he must, pre he must do all the things that he needs to do. Let me just say this, a farmer cannot do what only God can do. So the farmer cannot cause the rain to fall. The farmer cannot make the precipitation be right, the humidity, the right amount of temperature, this and that. Some of this atmospheric stuff is in the hand of God. But let me just say this, God will not do what the farmer must do. So God will not come down, prepare the ground and do all that just because we are standing by faith and believing for it to come to pass. Just because you've had a vision or a dream about something, sitting on your dream and your vision and not doing anything about it is not going to make it come to pass. A dream comes through much activity. Somebody say activity. You've got to act. You've got to do something. You've got, if you see it in here, you've got to take corresponding action. Faith without action is dead. The just shall walk. We walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by faith. Amen. Now faith does not, we will have, and I, and I, I need to drum this, the, the drum this into our spirit. Faith does not excuse us from hard works. Faith do, does not, um, uh, I'm looking for that English word. Praise the Lord. What's the word I said last Sunday, two Sundays ago? There's a word I use. Uh, it doesn't, we don't exchange our, we, it's, it's, it'll come to me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Amen. But we don't use, we don't, it's not an excuse. We cannot say we have faith and now we don't need to put any action. Amen. It doesn't excuse us from working hard. It doesn't excuse us. So the moment you have got vision, you've got faith. Something has come. God has shown you a dream. He has given you a vision of something. Whether it's to be debt free, to own your own home. Whatever that vision or that dream is, you need to take a step in the right direction to see that dream come to pass. The moment you begin to walk, God begins to walk with you. The moment you begin to move, God begins to move on your behalf. The Bible says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. The lepers who are outside the walls of Samaria, as long as they stayed there, God did not move. But the moment they said, we, why sit we here and die? Let us go. And to, to, to the enemies come and they took a step. The Bible says, the armies of heaven began to march with them. And the enemy who was, who were in the camp had a massive army coming and they fled and they took off. And so let me just say this, that prophetic word that, that the prophet had said, had given that tomorrow, this time tomorrow, you will have all this food. Even when they were eating, you know, dung and, 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 and bad poop and trying to eat each other's children. That's how bad things had gotten. But he said, this time tomorrow, this is what's going to happen. But somebody had to take a step in the direction of where the issue was. Amen. 
And so we need to be able to take a step. We need to be able to act. A dream, uh, for a dream comes through much activity. A dream comes through much activity. So God has given us dreams. He has given us visions. He has told us, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to go. Some of us, God may have birthed in us, you know, to be self-employed. And, and, and every time you're working, every day you are frustrated and and you in your mind you keep seeing yourself self-employed but but every time you step out to start a business you you keep on thinking about oh this one tried it and failed and that one tried it and failed and what if the what ifs are the enemies of progress amen they will keep us from being able to step out into the breakthrough and the blessing god has for us he who quarry stones may be hurt by them in other words, it is, it is whenever we get ready to build, whenever we get ready to create, and I'm talking about builders and creators here. When the Bible talks about quarries and it talks about wood, it's talking about builders and it's talking about creators. Every time you get ready to build anything, any time you get ready to create anything, there's always a risk associated with it. There's always a risk. For a dream to come to pass, the activities that are needed for that dream to come to pass, sometimes those activities are risky activities. Stepping out and starting something is risky. There is a fear of failure. There is an opportunity. But you've got to keep on keeping on and step out just like Peter stepped out of that boat. There was a chance he could have sunk. When God said, come, when Jesus said, come, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come. The moment he took a step out of that boat, that was a risk in itself. He could have sunk. He could have, he could have gone under. But let me just say this. If you keep your eyes on Jesus and you keep on focusing on the Lord, anybody that does not want, let me just say this. And, and, and I pray that we as God's people not only become hearers of the word only, but become doers of the word. If we are going to walk on water, we can never be that in the boat. Amen. And most of us, we always begin life in the comfort zone. The comfort zone is where we don't have to really stretch out much in order to see things change and things happen. We are, we, there's always a temptation to stay in the comfort zone where we don't really have to believe for too much and there's not real, much, real risk in that place. But God has called us to walk by faith. The walk of faith is a risky walk. It is a risky walk. Every time you use your gift in order to multiply it and produce something, it is risky. There's always risk in business. Amen. You can make a loss in the middle of doing business. But the gift, the one who received five talents went and did business with this gift. One of the definitions I, I, the, the, of business is, is, is undertaking a, a risky endeavor. Sometimes it pays, sometimes it doesn't. We tend to hear about the successes. Many times we don't hear about the, the losses. But let me just say this. There is always an opportunity for, for progress and increase if we are willing to face the risk and be able to take that step and do what only God can do through us. Amen. So let me talk to us a little bit about the builders. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. When we talk about quarrying stones and, and the builders, the Bible talked to us about the, the stone that the builders rejected has become what? The chief cornerstone. So you've got two kinds of people here. You've got builders and you've got stones. And throughout life, you will either be a builder and a stone or both. You will always find yourself being a builder and a stone. Amen. Amen. The stone that the builders rejected has become a chief cornerstone. There is a, there is a risk with working with stones. Amen. There is a risk with working with stones. When you're a builder, there is a risk with working with stones. Jesus said the stone that the builders rejected. Who are the builders? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the leaders of his day. And who was the stone that they rejected? It was Jesus himself. He was that stone that they rejected. And he says has become a chief cornerstone. Let me just say this. Every stone has the potential to become a chief cornerstone. And we as builders, we are to work with the stones and shape them and shift them and move them and, and prepare them and remove their rough edges and, and line them up so that they can go from being stones to becoming chief cornerstones. 
Now one thing you've got to understand that also the builders are also, I mean the, the stones are also the builders. Every builder is a stone and every stone is a builder. Jesus spoke to the disciples and this is what he said. He said, who do men say that I am? And, and they said all sorts of things. And then Peter said, you are the Christ. And he said, good on you, John, uh, you know, Peter, uh, Simon Peter, uh, son of jo Bar Jonah. He says, on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock. Now, the, the stone that the builders rejected now is the builder. He says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So Jesus himself is a builder, but he's also a rock. Hallelujah. One of the things we need to understand is that we have to be in a place where we allow ourselves to be shaped and to be formed by God. Because every time you go to a quarry, you know, when you drive going um, to Westbrook through the back way, you will see those quarries there. There is a risk when they put dynamite there and they begin to blow up the side of the mountain and those big rocks starts rolling down. How many of you know that's risky? Most of us, we want a finished product. We want th something shaped nice and cute and beautiful and, and nice. But, but we don't understand for it to get there, it had to begin like that. Oh, hallelujah. So some of us, we are praying with our vision, seeing the finished product, seeing the house. But we don't understand for us to get the house, you might need a diamond, dynamite. Amen. You may need to go and dig up the side of the mountain. You may need to blow something up. You may have to deal with some big boulders and big rocks that you may have to shape and, and fashion and do all these things in order to get to a finished product. Most people always want the end result, but they don't know about the price they have to pay to go through the process to get to the end results. And some people God will send to you. And let me just say these people are all kinds of shapes of rocks. Some of them are nice and smooth and easy to work with. Some of them are jagged. Amen. They will cut your hand when you try to pick him up. Some of them are light. Some of them are heavy. Carrying all kinds of offense. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It is risky when you go to quarry. In the, there's a risk that you may get hurt doing what you have been called by God to do. And so you can never look at the issues and the, and, and, and the opposition and you've been pushed back as an indication that God didn't call you to do that. You can't say, well, if God was behind me, then he should have, been, he should have given me a nice finished product so that I can just put it into place and put it into place and, and, put it, and be able to build this thing. But sometimes he will give you the chisel and the dynamite and tell you there's the mountain. If you want to see the finished product, you better get to work. And there's danger in the quarry. I came to help somebody understand there's danger in the quarry. Lord, I want to have 10,000 people. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus said, didn't I choose 12 of you? Yeah, one of you is a devil. <laughs> Amen. And he only had 12. Now, let me just say, out of 10,000, you may have to deal with 1,000 that are wishing for nothing but your downfall. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so we are seeing the 10,000, but you don't understand. There is a price to pay for you to step into your success. And the price sometimes is having to deal with the opposition and the conflict of favor. Every favor that God gives you attracts conflict. You cannot be favored and not have to deal with conflict. Lord, I just want to be blessed, but I don't want to deal with anything. Every time they give you the coat of many colors, your brothers will hate you. They will plot to put you in the pit. But what you need to understand is that is all in the process of God. Because every, come on somebody. God will use that to take you to your destiny. He will use that to take you to the process. The fact that they are difficult and they are hard to deal with is part of your training. Not only are you sharpening them, but they are sharpening you. Oh. In that process, you are both a builder and a rock at the same time. Come on, somebody. And so God is shaping you while you're trying to shape them. Let me tell you, my biggest, uh, my, uh, when I was an evangelist just traveling, going to places, preaching, you know, it's very easy. You just go in, you preach, you get your offering, you go. You don't have to deal with anybody, change any diapers, have to help, stand with any. I mean, it's easy to be an evangelist. 
It's very easy. But the moment I began to pastor, then I had to be there with the people when they were happy and when they were crying. I was there in the wedding and I was there in the funeral. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I was there when they said I do. I was there when they were struggling in their marriage. I was there throughout those processes. And let me tell you, not only was I able to add value and help them, but they, my, by helping them, I was also helped. It shaped me to help shape you. It helps me to help help whenever I help you. And let me tell you, he who waters others will be watered himself. This is the process of God. How many of you are getting this? And so God shapes you as you shape others. Let me, t I hear parents saying all the time, my kids teach me this and they teach me that and they teach me this. Yet you as a parent should be teaching them. But they are teaching you because you must be a rock and not just a builder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so for you to be successful, you must become teachable. We must become ready to learn, ready to be, for God to work in us and, and improve us. The moment we think we have arrived, we will never be able to get to where God wants us to get to. Somebody else has got something that can add value to your life. And we have to be humble enough to see value in somebody else. Even those who may be less than us in our own vision. Amen. We have to be able to get to that place. And so the stone, let me, let me read this. This will bless somebody. Uh, Mark chapter 8, uh, uh, Luke chapter 20 rather, verse 17 and verse 18. This helps us to understand what happens in the quarries. Now, verse 17 says, then he looked at them and said, what then is that, uh, what then is this that is written? Luke 20 verse 17 and verse 18. Then he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So not only are we working on the stones, but the stones are working on us. Amen. So God is breaking us every single time. In those areas where we need to be broken. Those areas where there's stubbornness in ourselves. And, and we have to deal with issues. God is working on us. The Bible says it's not just us speaking about the stone that the builders reject. It says this very clearly. It says whoever falls on the stone will be broken. Whoever falls on it will be broken. And the Bible says whoever it falls on will be what will be will be will be crushed to dust this is the risk that we have when we work with stones the stone can fall on you amen or you can fall on the stone it is it is an opportunity we see they are uh, uh, moses falling on the stones Many times when God spoke to him to do things and he did and, and, and because of the complaining of the people, he, he would do something opposite to what God told him. God one time says to him, go and speak to the rock. But the people complaining and whinging and complaining, he gets to the rock and instead of speaking to the rock, he begins to hit the rock. And God says to him, because you have done that, you have not hallowed me before the people, you will not step into the promised land. And let me just say this, because he, he, he allowed himself to fall onto the rock and the rock began to crush him and the rock began to deal with him. And so we have to come to Jesus, the rock of ages and say, God, you do in me what only you can do. You make in me what only you can make. So that when I deal with the rocks, the rocks will not crush me, but the, and I will not fall on it so that I'm broken. Amen. So this is the risk. And many times, every time we're in the process of building anything, there's a, pro there's a risk, it will fall on us, and there's a risk we may fall on it. But let me just say this, all in all, it is for our good. It is for our good. And God will shape us and mold us and bring us to that place whereby we are able to become like a glove in God's hands that he can use. If you look at Joseph, Joseph went through a lot of troubles. His trouble began when he had a dream. The sun, the moon, the stars bowing to him, the sheaves of wheat. The moment you begin to receive a dream, get ready for the journey. Amen. He got that dream and then the favor came. The coat of many colors. And, then, and, and every time God gives you a dream, he will give you favor. And that favor will put you on a journey. And, and, but we have to understand that all things work together for good. 
But those who are called by God and, and, and those, who are, you know, those, who are, those who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. So that is the only thing that we can focus on and step out of the boat and understand that no matter what happens, it will be for my good. When we have that revelation, then we have no more fear. We will not just sit in the boat and hope that the Lord will help us to get to the other place. But we will be able to step out and do the impossible. Those who believe will do what I do and greater things than this shall they do. There is a risk in stepping out to do those things. That is why not too many people call people up on the altar and lay hands on them for healing. It's risky. It's risky. Amen. We call people out, prophesy to them. You have to learn to hear from God. There's a risk in everything that we do. What if they don't get healed? I remember I went to a meeting and this guy was talking about how Jesus is going to heal the sick. And, and if anybody has no legs and God is going to give you a brand new leg, come down here and uh, you, God is going to heal you. God is, and he was a pastor of this church I was, I was, I was, I was at. And God is going to do this for you. And, and all these people came down to the front and he said, okay, Pastor Jimmy, come here. Here's the microphone. You can pray for the sick. I said, oh, you dog, you. <laughs> here's a person without you know with a prosthetic arm i'm like why didn't you just call headaches and back problems and amen how many of you know what i'm talking about that's risky it's risky but you know what you will never know the power of god until you learn to take a risk until you learn to step out that is where the glory and the grace of god begins the moment you step out amen and the reason why many times we don't really walk in the supernatural power of God is because we don't take any risk to pray for anybody. We will stand and talk about, Lord, I want to raise the dead. But let me tell you, when the opportunity comes, we are over the other side. We don't want anything to do with it. No, take that opportunity. I always say, never pray for the gift of healing if you don't take the opportunity to pray for the sick when the opportunity arises. Amen. So we have to take that step. And so if there's somebody dies, you know, start with your pet. Amen. If your cat dies, you, I'm, I'm poured oil on my cat. I'm still believing. One of these days, we're going to raise the dead. Glory be to God. We have seen people raised up who are the point of death. Just yesterday in Brisbane, I, I, I had a lady um, come to me, an Indian lady. Her name is Sini. She came to me. She said, Pastor Jimmy, my wife, my, my husband and I came up to your church uh, some time back. You know, one of those people that visit from Brisbane. And she said, I didn't tell you at that time. I just told you I was sick, but I had, uh, but I had a brain tumor. And, uh, and it's a terminal thing. And he said, I came to the meeting and you prayed for me. To me, it was a Sunday morning. I just prayed for her like I would pray for everybody else. But she was in a place of believing God. She went home. And when she got home, uh, uh, she went to the doctors. And when they checked her, they said there was nothing there. We can't find anything. There's a bit of scarring there. They Come on. Praise the Lord. She could have gone the other way. But the Lord intervened in there. And so we have to take that step, step of faith and say, Lord, I am willing. If you will, Lord, if I put my hand up, use me, I will take that step of faith and I will do what you've called me to do. So there's a danger in being, being, being a, a stonemason. There's a danger in being a builder. There's a danger in it. But don't fall for that. Don't let fear or fear of failure or fear of not working. Don't let that stop you. You keep on keeping on. Amen. I had a friend of mine, they started to start a shop and they put in a $20,000 order to order some goods from China. They were so excited how they're going to start their business. And you know what? They hadn't done their research properly and sent some money, the money to scammers and the pro product didn't come. And I had to point to them this week and say to them, you know, not, not anyone in this church, but, but somebody uh, from Brisbane and uh, one of my friends. And I said to them, don't give up. You know, everybody that's ever made anything had to go through this as bumps on the road. You know, this is just a pit experience. You can't let the pit be your final resting place. Amen. Your dream is too big. 
Your vision is too gig. Come out of that pit. Yes, you may be in the auction block and you may be sold out, but it's okay. You may end up in Potiphar's house and it doesn't look like the vision that you've seen. Don't give up. Don't give him. Don't throw in the towel. That's just a bump on the road. You got to pick yourself up. Encourage yourself in the Lord and you save up again and this time do what you need to do. Sharpen your axe and do due diligence and check your suppliers and make sure they're five star rated and be able to step in again and do what you want to do don't let the one little hiccup keep you from stepping into your dream and many people are discouraged because they tried it once and it failed and now they've given up because it's like this and like that but you've got to learn how to be tenacious you're going to be you're going to learn how to press in and push it and not give up and not give in amen there's a reason why those people are the way they are. There's a reason why they are successful like the way they are successful. Many of us see their success, but if you listen to their story, you will find out how many times they failed and refused to give up. Donald Trump has been bankrupt five times. Five times bankrupt. And then some reporter wrote and said he's no longer a billionaire, he's just a millionaire, and he's actually bankrupt because his debts were more than, than his net worth. You know what he did? He sued the guy. He said, don't you, you know, because he was standing on his vision. That's not just a brand. That is his vision. I'm a billionaire. And you know what? He bounced back from being broke, being, I mean, he went back to being a billionaire. Four times, he refused to stay down. He picked himself up. And he ended up in that place four times. I mean, it's one thing to lose 10,000, 20,000. This guy lost billions and then came back. And not only that, but ended up in the White House. When everybody said this guy, ooh, it was a joke. When he said, I'm going to become run for president. People look the other way. They say, oh yeah, whatever. Never happened. They were not laughing. A few, one month, you know, six months later when he's walking into the White House. How many of you know what I'm talking about? doesn't matter who's against you just believe that God is for you and if God be for you who can be against you you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you amen the world may be against you may stand against you but you keep believing and let me tell you the impossible will become possible amen I have a vision. Toowoomba is going to be a mecca of revival, miracles, signs, and wonders. This church is not going to be big enough. We're going to have two, three services a day. I mean, every Sunday to try and accommodate the people coming in. Come on, somebody. You're going to live by vision. You can't let the world shape your belief and your vision and tell you this, that, and the other. You're going to believe what God is showing you. Amen. Let me just touch on this and then I'm going to finish. And he who splits wood may be endangered by it. He who splits wood may be endangered by it. This has to do with people who are creative. You see, many times when you pray and you say, God, give me a table. God shows you a tree. And he gives you vision so that you can be able to see a table when you look at a tree. The reason why, you know, everything you see here, whether it's this stage I'm standing on, whether it's the piece of paper we're looking at here, I mean, everything, some of the structural uh, parts of this building, all this began as a tree. It all began as a tree. It is vision that allows us to look at a tree and see a table. It is vision that allows us to look at a tree and be able to see a house. It is vision that allows us to look at a tree and be able to see a, a cabinet or whatever it is that, that, that God wants to give us. But for us to be able to get to that, there is a risk in chopping down the tree. Amen. A tree is safe to be around until you pick up your axe. Amen. And the bigger the tree, the bigger the risk. You can go on YouTube and look at all the near misses. Amen. The tree can fall whichever way. It can fall on you, fall on the house, fall. I mean, we've seen that happen where trees have fallen and people are about to run for their lives in the process of cutting that tree. The, you see, the moment you begin to cut something, there is a risk that comes to it. But you cannot allow that risk to keep you from pursuing the dreams and the vision that God has given you. 
And that's why I said we have to learn to sharpen our, our skills and sharpen your axe so that we can minimize the risk that comes with doing whatever we need to do. Sharpen your skills. One of the reasons why we sharpen our skills is that it minimizes risk in whatever it is that we're doing. Amen. If you ever go to a doctor, maybe a brain surgeon, the first thing you want to know is how many times have you done this? Isn't that right? If somebody needs that kind of surgery, first question you ask them. When they tell you, okay, we're going to have to open your skull here and go in here and do this and that and the other. Uh, how many times have you done this? They tell you, oh, what, just once? Uh-uh. <laughs> we're going to another one. Praise the Lord. Why? Because they haven't sharpened their skill enough. And so you need to sharpen your skill to minimize the risk. So if somebody said, oh, we've done, you know, 4,000 of these. And then you're like, okay, I feel I'm, I'm at beat. I'm in a place where I'm at, at peace. Amen. I'm in a, in a peaceful place. I can trust what you're saying because you've, you've sharpened your skill to the point whereby I know we have minimized the risk. One of the most important things about sharpening your skills is that it minimizes the risk. The chances of failure are minimized every time you sharpen your skill. Sharpen your skill. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, sharpen your skill. So whenever you get ready to cut down that tree. Now let me talk a little bit about trees. Trees are also people. One time Jesus prayed for somebody. Took him out of the city. Said, what do you see? Say, I see men like trees. I see men like trees. I see men like trees. Trees are people. Sometimes in order to produce what needs to be produced in somebody is risky. For me to shape what I need to shape in, in somebody's life, it may, need, it may mean that I need to begin by cutting them. Glory be to God. You may need to begin by chopping something down. Chopping attitudes, chopping down, you know, bad behavior, chopping down, you know, getting offended every five seconds. Chopping. If you're going to be a leader, there's a stuff that needs to be chopped down. Come on, somebody. And when that thing's getting chopped down, that, th that person may fall on you. You may become the enemy. And so you need wisdom in how to know how to chop the tree in a way that you can produce beautiful things out of that tree. And many times the Lord will bring you people in that raw condition. They're like big giant oaks. They have great potential in them. But they need somebody to come and be able to shape all that out. Out of them. And bring beauty out of that mess that may be there. But sometimes to do that, you may need to put the axe to the ground, to the roots. You may need to put the axe there and begin to chop it, chop it, chop it. Sometimes you may need to chop it in order to move it. Because some people may not be able to be helped where they are. You need to shift them and move them and take them to different places in the spirit to get them to where they need to get to. You may need to do all that. It takes labor for that to become a house, for that to become a table, for that to become a chair, for that to become that which you're seeing in your spirit. It takes time. It takes time. And so we as God's people should not become so, so, so fearful of failure, fearful of stepping out. Let me just say, every failure is a learning experience. Every time you mess up, you will learn more from failing than from succeeding. Amen. And that's when you become the stone. The situation now becomes the builder. And it builds you. And you become better at your job. Better at you, what you're doing, by what God's called you to do. Just because you've allowed yourself to be shaped and molded by God. Amen. Can we have, um, um, thank you, Melissa. We're going to close here. I'm just going to encourage somebody because I felt in my heart that many of us, we have got visions and dreams. Some of us, we are very creative. God has given us the ability to see things. Some of you, you have got a, you, you, you've got business. My brother is a businessman. To me, I mean, he loves business. He's going in the banking side. But I remember, I used to see a, a push bike. My dad would buy us push bike, you know, to share amongst ourselves. And I look at the push bike and I'm like, yes, I'm going to play with this little push bike. But my brother, when he looks at the push bike, he's seeing how much he can sell it for. 
I reckon we can sell this for this amount. Then we can buy a cheaper push bike and keep the other half for lollies. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> say some people, you can walk through a junkyard and you see money. Come on, somebody. That's creative. You People see junk, but you look at there. You, they, you see treasure. You see things that, you know what? I can, I can do something with this. I can take this and turn it around. And I can see something good coming out of this. That is creative. There are people here who are creative. Amen. One man's trash is another man's treasure. You walk through the landfill and other persons can see nothing but rubbish. But for you, you see opportunity. You see an ability to get to another place, to get to another level. You see, somebody else may say, this is just waste and nothing and nothing will come. But creativity, that vision that you have inside of you. And we need to pray and say, God, open my eyes because there's opportunities all around. Let me tell you, from the time you walk, drive from here to home, you've driven past 20 opportunities that can make you a millionaire. But you need to pray and say, God, open my eyes so that where others see trash, I see gold. That is what creative people do. They are able to dig and find treasure, then go and pay the price and buy the land to find the treasure that is buried in the land. God wants us to know that if we are going to see treasure coming out of the trash that we find ourselves in, if we're going to get that treasure, there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. We may have to sell everything to buy the land to be able to get to the treasure. But creativity, to be able to see beyond what is on the outside and see the value, the intrinsic value that is in something. That is a gift and an ability and anointing that God wants to release over his people in this season. But it takes risk. It takes risk. When you buy that car, you're hoping to fix it so you can flip it and sell it. You may not be able to fix it. That's risky. That's a risky thing. The house that you want to buy that may be a very good deal. There's a reason why it's cheap. Amen. You go in there and you've got about a hundred thousand termites as your, as, your, as your housemates. And so you may have to deal this and it may, but it's a risky. But you know what? This is why some of these guys have gone from where they are to where they are, they, you know, where they become successful in whatever business that they're doing. Why? Because they are willing to take that chance. They are willing to step out and, and be able to see treasure where other people are seeing trash. And they say, Lord, give me the ability so and I can cut this tree. I can be able to manage that risk. I can know whether I should buy this house and, and fix it up and flip it or not. Whether I can know whether this business, which is now not doing very well, but I can buy it and turn it around and make it profitable. How I, this is how, how Warren Buffett became what he is. He buying companies and flipping, turning them into successful companies and selling them. And so God begins to give us that creative, this creativity. But there's always a risk. We can choose to stay in the comfort zone where we just do what we've always done and get what we've always got and be satisfied with that. Every day is the same old, same old. We are safe. We're just operating in a safe place. But you know that can be frustrating for some. Because this message is not for everybody. Because some people, that is where they want to be. The majority. But I'm here to speak to the one, the Peters, who are saying, you know what? I don't want to sit in the boat anymore. I want to do what Jesus is doing. If he walks on water, I want to walk with water on water like him. If he's raised in the dead, I want to raise the dead like him. If he's, if what, I want to do the works of God. Anyone that wants to do the works of God cannot sit in the boat and just be comfortable in the boat. But I came to speak to the Peters that yes, there's a risk you may begin to sink because you're distracted. But you know what? Turn your eyes to Jesus. Call upon him and he will pull you out. Let me tell you, you've got God as your partner. You've got Jesus as your partner. You can throw the net on the side of the boat and catch nothing. But when you understand who's on your side, who's on your board, who's your partner in business, when he tells you throw the net on the right side, you will get more fish coming out. Come on, somebody. Than you have ever been able to pull out. You will be able to call others and say, listen, I am so blessed. I need somebody to help me to bring in the blessing. You are so blessed that you become a blessing. God wants to bless you so that you will be so blessed that you don't even, you can't, don't have room enough to, to receive. 
Some of you, you're going to be able to be calling other people and saying, listen, I, I've got two vehicles I want to give away. I cannot be bothered to sell it. I'm too blessed to be wasting my time selling. Do you want this? Because my God, come, come on somebody. He wants to bless you to that place. Say you end up with five houses, come on. And then you're tired of mowing five lawns until you say, listen, I'm just going to bless some people because I'm so blessed. I don't even need to sell it. I'm going to find some homeless moms and some homeless orphans and, and say to them, do you want a house? I want to bless you with this house. We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And let me tell you, for us to get there, we have to be like Peter. Many are called but few are chosen. The reason why many fail and they never become chosen is because they fail the test of dealing with risk. It's too risky. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Something may happen. Let's all stand. We're going to close right now. I don't want to do it. It may fail. I don't want to go there. There's nobody there. I love this man, Bishop Oyedepo. When he went and planted his church, People say to him, why are you going outside Lagos to plant your church? He built, he bought a piece of land out of, out of the city. And, and people said, you need to be in the city for people to come to your church. You are out there in the bush, in the sticks. This is Africa. They, people don't have vehicles. They can't walk to all the way out there. They said, and he said, no, God has spoken to me. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to build it. And let me just say this. He built, a, I think it's a 100,000 seater building. How many of you know that's faith? And now he's getting ready to lift it up and try and get a 400, I think, thousand seater building. Because the pe there's too many services to do. People, they call it Canaan land. He, built, he bought this piece of land. Built this massive building. And now people are coming from everywhere I mean, all roads are leading to this particular church. There's another church called RCCG. I'm just stretching your faith. Amen. Because when we look around, you see empty seats. But let me tell you, if we can stretch our faith, Toowoomba has 160, around Toowoomba region has around, around 160,000 people. A hundred and maybe 20,000 in the city itself. Do you know when they did the census, almost about 10 to 15 to 20,000 people go to church or identified as Christian? That's, that's, a, that's, a, bad, that's a bad percentage. 15,000 out of 120,000. We've got many people to bring in. Let me tell you, when revival hits, this building is not going to be enough. Every church in Toowoomba is not going to have enough space. That pastor of RCCG, uh, I, uh, that the pastor of that church when he decided to build this church you can go check this out on on youtube that church is is nine square kilometers are, are you hearing what i'm saying that church is three kilometers this way three kilometers that way that means when the pastor is standing here that wall is 1.5 k's that way that wall is 1.5 k's that way and the back row is three kilometers down that way and you know what? You go check it out. It's too small. 1.2 million people worshiping every Sunday morning. They're now increasing it to about 4.5 Ks to 5 kilometers. This is a building. You can see this thing from space. I'm just stretching your faith. Can I stretch your faith a little bit? Amen. Let's lift up our hands. I know God can do it in Australia. Because he's the same God in Africa as he is over here. He is the Lord and he changes the Lord. We're just going to make room for him. Let's stretch our faith. Let's stretch our vision, our faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us and to stretch us right now. To not be afraid, not to be anxious for anything. But I pray for the business people who are here. Lord, that they will be able to step into the impossible situations and be able to see blessings and blessings and blessings as they learn to partner with you and invite you to their wedding. If they run out of wine, you will be there to multiply and bless them. If they throw in the net and bring nothing out, Father, I thank you that, Lord, if they make room for you in their boats, that you will be able to cause their boats to be full of fish. Thank you, 
Father God, that we as your people are partnering this morning with you in all our endeavors. I want you right now to just invite God, invite Jesus into your boat. Invite him to be your partner in this, in this business. And not for him to be your minor partner, but to be your senior partner in Jesus' name. Just tell him right now, Jesus, I'm inviting you to be my master, to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my head. I want you to be, come on somebody. Lord, we know that you know how to bring in contracts. You know how to bring in customers. You know how to cause us to turn a profit and go from red to, 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 to black. We thank you, Lord, that you know how to bless your people. We thank you, Father God, that you are our partner. That where we have failed in the past, we are bringing you with us. Just like the sons of the prophets brought Elijah with them. So that when they lost their accent, Elijah was able to put a stick on the water and cause that which was lost to be found again. So, Father, we partner with the prophetic. We partner with the anointed. We partner with you that we can be able to do it in your ability, your supernatural ability. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So, Father God, we invite you. Just invite him right now. Every endeavor of your life that you have seen struggle and failure, where you are fearful of stepping out by faith, right now, just invite him to take your hand. Say, Jesus, take my hand. Take my hand. Take my hand. Like Peter, who stepped out of the boat when he began to sing, Jesus took his hand. Take my hand, Lord Jesus. Take my hand. Take my hand. Take my hand, Lord. In all these endeavors, take my hand. With you, there is no reason risk with you there is no risk you mitigate all risk in this life we thank you lord jesus that our security is in you you are our insurance uh, plan we thank you lord for your presence in our lives we take you with us we partner with you